yeah and if you have any questions throughout the event feel free to pop them into the chat either on youtube or on zoom i'll be monitoring both um i would just want to introduce myself i'm tavi juarez i'm the vice president of the international center for women playwrights i'm so happy you guys came and joined us for this event um, just a, a couple of things about us and who we are and what we do. Uh, we're the International Center for Women Playwrights. Um, we uh, do events like this. We I opened this up to the to all of social media and the public, so I don't expect everybody here to know who we are. Um, but our mission and our vision is to uh, connect, inspire, and empower women playwrights to achieve equality on the world stages. And I encourage you to please come and join us if you are a woman playwright. Uh, we have opportunities, we share opportunities, we have script feedback groups, uh, and we have circles where we all connect and engage with one another. Um, you can find out more about us at www.womenplaywrights.org. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to just let me know. Um, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say. So I'm gonna pass this event along to Cindy, who's going to lead us through this discussion. And then at the end, if you guys have questions that pop up during this, please feel free to put them into the chat and then we'll field them at the end. We'll have a moment for questions and stuff. So yeah, that's it, Cindy, I'll send it over to you. Okay, so um, uh, so for Joanne, you think you could turn off your video? Um, turn off your video. Uh, so anyhow, I'm Cindy Cooper. I'm a playwright, and okay, no problem. Uh, <laughs> um, and I want to introduce Alexis Green. Hello, Alexis, G R E E N E, <laughs> and Alexis is the author of this marvelous book, uh, Emily Mann, Rebel Artist of the American Theater, and. Um, so it is about Emily Mann, who is uh, a playwright, a director, and, and was the artistic director up until about a year ago of the McCarter, uh, which is one of the largest uh, regional, regional theaters. But I really wanted to talk about Emily Mann as a playwright. And so that's um, what I've invited Alexis to do here. And we're going to really kind of... Uh, hone in and focus on maybe four plays that she wrote. And um, I'll just say what what I liked about the book is, uh, and, and going behind the scenes of these plays, is that uh, as playwrights, we're so isolated, generally. We, we're not in other people's productions, so we don't know if, like, the, the producer yells at you or if they've asked you to rewrite something, you know, five times or if everything is just hunky-dory and there's, you know, only parties. So um, being inside the um, experience of another playwright was really fascinating to me. And then the other thing is because Alexis is a, a critic a uh, observer, a cultural observer, and has an uh, ability to bring big picture things to um, to theater. She's written eight books about theater, um, including a biography of Lucille Lortel and several others. She's able to bring um, a, a perspective to the topic that a lot of um, contemporary books, uh, books about contemporaries can't do or don't do because um, they're too, it's a subject speaking and they don't really have the objectivity. And so um, let me just first just dive in, you know, Alexis, what, what is it that made you want to write this book? <laughs> thank you, Cindy. And first of all, you know, thank you to uh, the International Center and, you know, for making this happen tonight, it's, it's terrific. Uh, so what made me want to do this? I've written, as you said, a biography of Lucille Ortel, which was published back in 2004. Lucille was uh, an off-Broadway producer, among other things. And really the focus of that book was on the off-Broadway movement and, and its evolution. And I wanted to write another biography and I wanted it to really be about a person as well as a person's art. I wanted it to be about a woman. I wanted it to be about a woman's art. 
and also relate that playwriting art to the times in which she, the, the woman was writing. And uh, I had known Emily Mann at least since 1983 and huh? we had become friendly. And around 2014, I sent her a LinkedIn message and I said, hey, what would you think about <laughs> my writing a biography of you? And she wrote back immediately, sure, that would be great. Good use of LinkedIn. Good to yeah. know. So, um, I so I really want to talk to you about four plays, and the, they're um, they. This is kind of chronological, but I think they all from presented different um, issues, and you know, from a playwriting perspective. So they are for, um, still life, then execution of justice, uh, having our say, and then uh, Gloria a, a life. I think that's the title. So let's just start with um, Still Life. That 1978, um, Emily Mann wrote this. It's And each of these is a chapter in your book, or, or some of them are too. But, and that's a story of a, a Marine who's returned from Vietnam. They had some horrific experiences there. And um, it's paired with the stories of his wife and his lover. Um, and I, um, I, I picked up one line from the chapter you wrote. You said, and I, I that the second reading, which was in Minneapolis at the Guthrie, or in Minneapolis, one of the, somebody in the audience said the play blew everyone's minds. I called the producer and in the middle in the middle of the night and said, "You have to do this." And you know, and, and Emily Mann is known for theater of testimony. Almost all of her work, or at least all of these pieces, are about real life people uh, and, and real life circumstances. So, how how did she get into doing still life? What makes it unique? What, what was the experience like? Well, just to backtrack a little bit, and that's a great introduction to it. She, uh, she had been sort of what we would call today an intern, an apprentice at uh, the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis. And uh, she had written a play called Anula Allen, the autobiography of a survivor, which was produced there in their second stage in 1977. And it was essentially a monologue. Uh, drawn from Emily's and a friend's interviews with this woman in England. She was a Holocaust survivor. And so when Emily was introduced to the Vietnam vet and interviewed him and his wife and his, uh, and his lover, she formed it as three monologues initially. And there was a reading at the Guthrie uh, of the play uh, in its early draft. And her then boyfriend, Jerry Matt Famine, uh, talked with her after the reading and said, you know, it would really be a much more dynamic play if you could intercut these monologues, break them up, interweave the lines so that even though these three people are not talking to each other directly, there does seem to be dialogue. And so what Emily told me essentially is that through this play, she found the form of playwriting that she had stayed with throughout. It became the form for theater of testimony uh, because these three people are giving testimonials essentially about their lives, their thoughts, their problems. Um, but she's arranged the cause cut the monologues, the original monologues, so that they do seem to be dialogue and there is conflict and there is theatricality. And this is a form that she has stayed with throughout her, her playwriting career. In, in addition, the, the play touches really for the first time, well, very, significantly for the first time on themes that she would continue to touch upon. Violence, violence in the world beyond these three people, the violence of war, 
domestic violence because the Vietnam vet comes home and he beats his wife, he abuses her. And uh, so, and so that is one theme that is paramount in this play. And it's also a feminist play, except that here the feminist is really, as I say in the biography, the feminist, feminist is Emily Mann raising a red flag because these two women are still under the, in the throes, under the control of this uh, Vietnam vet. In yeah, I thought, that, I thought that was a really interesting observation you had in there that they were so focused on healing him or helping him or making him happy. And I, I, I took something from the book. It says, there's no single definition of a feminist play. However, if one criterion is to portray women's um, marginalization within and subsequent resistance to a society where men dominate in public and private realms, still life qualifies. But the resistance is man's in the form of what could be considered a red alert. Yes, I, I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with what I wrote. Okay, well, okay. Uh, uh, and of course, the other uh, element that uh, of her playwriting, if you will, that uh, was significant here, as it had been with uh, Anula Allen, the play that came before this, is that she directed all three productions of this play. She directed uh, the first production in Chicago at the Goodman Theater. She directed the New York production at the Women's Project, uh, which was uh, at the Women's Project, and then she directed a, a production in, in California. She has always tried to direct the first productions of her plays. So I, I know that's a question we were going to ask later, but how, how do you think that being a director um, affects or influences her playwriting? And a lot of times playwrights are told they can't direct or they're, you know, they're not encouraged to direct particularly their own work. Um, so how did how did she get away with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, she's always been a very determined uh, individual. She didn't always get away with it, uh, as we'll talk to some degree as we as we go along here. But she liked to direct her own plays because she would work with the actors and uh, in workshops or rehearsals. Uh, she would uh, end up doing rewrites and the rewrites were often um, helped along by what the actors discovered uh, in the workshop or in the, in the rehearsal. And so she, it, it, it's sort of a, they were conducive to each other, directing and writing the play. Yeah. I, I, I want to move on to uh, execution of justice, but you tell one story about in one rehearsal, the actress wanted to be blindfolded. Oh, yes. Uh, that was Mary McDonald. Well, there was the discussion. You, the, the set ended up being simply uh, a table with these three people, the two women and the Vietnam vet behind the table. And... Uh, the only decor, if you will, is a screen behind the table because the Vietnam vet is now a photographer and he will show slides of some of his photographs. And one of the questions that arose was, well, since these people aren't exactly talking directly to each other, are they hearing each other? Hmm. Uh, you know, this, this was almost an actor question, if, if you will. And so during one rehearsal, I believe it was Mary McDonald who played uh, the veteran's wife. And she, you know, made sure that she couldn't hear anybody. And she, she just okay. explored how that felt. Okay. So let, let's go on to execution because we're going to, we're going to fly here because we're going to stay for 40 or 45 minutes total. And, um, 
So execution of justice um, that began as a project in 1978 to 1984, and then there's you have two chapters about that. Uh, another time period, and um, that was a, that was originally called the Dan White story. So, just a reminder for people: that uh, Dan White was the man who shot and killed Mayor George Moscone and um, the gay supervisor Harvey Milk in, in uh, San Francisco. He was tried, and he raised uh, famously raised a Twinkie defense that he'd had too much sugar. And the jury somewhat bought it in the sense that they didn't convict him of the most serious charges. They convicted him of um, of lesser charges, uh, man, uh, manslaughter instead of murder. And she was commissioned by the um, Eureka in San Francisco. And I believe they delivered her um, the transcript, like that was what she was supposed to write. Yeah. So, so what happened from there? <laughs> Uh, so the Eureka commissioned uh, Emily in 1982, and uh, yes, they they dumped this enormous trial transcript uh, in her lap, so to speak. And she he, she soon decided that it the play did have to be a trial play, and she also knew that she wanted video and film and to make it a little bit more traditionally documentary in style. And one of the, I mean, the story of how execution of justice uh, ended up being produced, where it was produced is, you know, one of these uh, not very happy stories in, in some respects, in terms of what can happen in the theater when you have to uh, negotiate with other, other directors and maybe even producers and do not necessarily know what they're what they're doing. Um, at any event, why why wasn't it a ha why you said do you say that? I know she didn't direct this one initially, but why why do you say it wasn't a happy story? Well, I mean, maybe that's the wrong choice of words. I mean, it was uh, a challenging. Uh, okay. Uh, series of events. Let me let me put it that way. That's that's probably a better way to to put it. Uh, she was commissioned by the Eureka, and she wrote a draft, which was about six hours long. It was three acts, and, and it took about six hours to read. And the Eureka didn't have a theater, and uh, they didn't have enough money to produce it anyplace else, so they couldn't produce it. And Emily took it to the Actors Theater of Louisville, and they produced it in 1984 with uh, the two men who ran Eureka directing it, Oscar Eustace and Tony Tacone. And I noticed and, I noticed in your book, you said there were nine plays that season, and this was the only one by a woman. That's right. This was the only one by a woman at the Humanities Festival in uh, this March of, of 1984. And you get the feeling pretty early on, or I got the feeling from talking with Emily and also doing research that she had always wanted to direct it. She said she liked the production at ATL, but she had other ideas. But in the meantime, uh, where was this play going to go after it was performed at uh, ATL? Where, by the way, it got excellent reviews, uh, even though most of the reviewers said it needed to, still to be cut somewhat. And so then the first real uh, significant regional production happened at Arena Stage in 1985, in the spring of 1985, with Doug Wager directing. And he brought in all, you know, film and uh, television clips and, you know, made it a, a tech event, essentially, as well as mm -hmm. the stage, you know, production. So that didn't come from her, that came from the director. Well, I mean, it, I mean, that's a very interesting point. She had called for it in the original, in her original uh, script, but uh, it had hardly existed at ATL in that first production. 
and Wager really brought it forth and, and used it, uh, you know, ex excellently, according to uh, all of the reviews uh, from DC and even farther out in the country. And by this time, she'd also managed to cull the script down to two acts. So it was it was considerably shorter than it had been previously. And but she still wanted to direct it. And so uh, she invited Mark Bly from the Guthrie Theater, who was the dramaturg there at the time, to come see the DC production. And he didn't think it was quite as great as everybody else did. And at any event, uh, she was invited to direct a production at the Guthrie in the fall of 1985, November 1985. Uh, meanwhile, the play acquires uh, two commercial producers who uh, offer Doug Wager the chance to direct it on Broadway. And Doug Wager accepts. Uh, but Emily, during the fall, at some point during the fall of uh, 1984, uh, excuse me, 1985, when she's directing at the Guthrie, she decides that she wants to direct the Broadway production. And after all, it's her play. And uh, so at some point, somebody calls up Doug Waker and says, sorry, so sorry, uh, but you're you're not going to be doing this. And um, it was the kind I describe in the book that it's the kind of you know uh, behind the scenes showbiz rumpus that doesn't look leave anybody looking very swell. Uh, you know, including Emily. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened with the play in. Uh, November at the Guthrie was that Dan White committed suicide in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. He had been let out of prison a little early. He moved to Los Angeles and then he tried to move back in with his wife who was still living in San Francisco. But he one day he got into his car and he rolled up the windows and turned on the gas and killed himself. And so Emily had to write uh, a new ending, so to speak. How, how was she going to incorporate this? And she wrote one line uh, toward about nine lines from the end of the script about how you know, Dan White on such and such a day uh, turned on the fumes in his car and, and uh, committed suicide. And I want to point out, she started out with the transcript, but quickly realized that it wasn't going to be contained by the transcript. It didn't tell enough of the societal influences. And so she added what was happening was this the chorus of uh, uncalled uh, witnesses. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me about bringing that up. Uh, she considered that the most significant change that she made to her script, that before she included a chorus of uncalled, uh, uncalled witnesses, the, the script had focused a little too much perhaps on the trial of Dan White and without the voices of other people who lived in San Francisco at the time, in one case a cop, another case a drag queen, um, the DA whose career was ruined by uh, the fact that he lost the case essentially. And so again, you have that form of testimony slash documentary play that is so, uh, uh, so much hers, which is that you you cut back and forth to uh, you know different voices, and she manages to make it a very theatrical experience as some, as these voices contrast and collide 
Right. So, I mean, that that's one thing that she is, I think, particularly adept at is writing about uh, content events, real life events that people know about, but bringing some other influences in it, into it that kind of give people an opportunity to see it in a slightly different way than they had when they, before they came into the theater. I think, I, I think it's the strongest play that she's written to date, um, among other things, because it gives not only a, a picture of a trial and a man on trial and a portrait of people in San Francisco at the time, but it allows us to see a world in which, an American world in which unfortunately, many people uh, fear and hate the other, quote unquote. And, you know, that is as, uh, unfortunately, as uh, al alive today as it was in 1984 when she began writing the play. Right. And, and one thing you write is, um, so it's a trial of values. The trial is a metaphor for a city on trial, country, and the times. So it's like she takes this, took this one event, I mean, in your view, took this one event and kind of like expanded the, the scope of it. Um, yes. Uh, I, I think she did that very consciously. Uh, that was that was a note, you know. She she keeps diaries and little notebooks. That she writes notes into herself as she directs and as she writes plays, and that was a, a note to herself. Which is and, a good point to add in at this point. You had access to all her materials, and you also interviewed a few people. <laughs> I interviewed. I interviewed nearly a hundred people. Yes, and yeah. I did. You know, um, I had access to all her files, her diaries. And you uh, went through like multiple drafts of plays and- uh, Multiple drafts of plays. I went to uh, the university. I, I interviewed, I traveled around the country. I in, went to the University of Chicago where her father's papers are and uh, looked through those. And uh, I don't know if you, we have time to go into this and made a wonderful discovery. I discovered uh, the audio tape of the first play she actually wrote, which has uh -huh. never been produced, which she wrote when she was uh, at Radcliffe. Oh, wow. That's cool. Well, I think um, just wrapping up on Execution of Justice, because I do want to talk about these two other plays. You have a line that really struck me. This is a quote from somebody. This is when she kind of insisted on directing on Broadway. And he said, you have to be courageous. You have to be courageous uh, with Emily. You have to be as courageous as she is. And I thought that was like kind of remarkable that she. Um, yes, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the play did go to Broadway. And unfortunately, uh, in 1986, it had the. Uh, eight previews and 12 performances. It was, you know, in a proscenium stage, it did not perhaps have the, uh, the kind of environment, kind of raw environment that it had had either at uh, the arena stage or, or at the Guthrie. And the uh, critics apparently were, you know, were not turned on, but it's, that's- it's, it's still being produced. Oh, yeah, definitely it's still being produced. I mean, you know, critics are not always right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think she made a mistake directing it? Well, as, uh, you know, uh, as, I, as I write in the book, they were, there were different views about that. Some people thought that, uh, you know, Doug Wager should have been allowed to uh, direct it on Broadway. And... Uh, others said, you know, a playwright should not direct their own work, to which Emily's response was the chutzpah of that woman. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I think directing on Broadway for a first attempt, it, it's going to be tough, and it was. And the second time around, as we 
on Chicago. Having our say. Um, yeah. It was a lot better. So this, so having her, our, her say was her second uh, Broadway production, right? And this, for just to remind people, this is based on a book, um, uh, Having Our Say by uh, what's her name? Amy, Amy Hill Hearth. Amy Hill Hearth with Annie Delaney and Sarah Delaney. And it's about their lives, the, the lives of two African-American women who were remarkable on their own, but had a very long life. One was a second African-American uh, dentist and uh, the other was uh, the first to teach home ec, African-American teach home ec in New York City. They were sisters. They were unmarried. They lived very full and rich lives. And the book kind of caught fire. And uh, so Emily started to make an adaptation of this. And that was kind of also a little bit different from the other two pieces. Well, this raises an interesting topic, and I, I would love to hear what some of, the, uh, or, or read what some of the viewers think about it. I asked Emily at one point, you know, what did she feel about this word adaptation? Uh, because it's used, it's, you know, it's thrown around all over the place. And, you know, she doesn't like it, and I don't blame her, because she thinks it undercuts, slightly denigrates the imagination of and the creativity of the playwright who has been inspired by another work, mm. uh, you know, has been inspired by a book or a play to transform that uh, into something else. So- The play inspired by. The play inspired <laughs> by. And- hey, um, uh, She, talk a little bit about, she went out to talk, met them and that sort of changed how she approached the production, right? Well, uh, or a concept, I, I guess. Remember which came first? I mean, just to to fill in a couple of gaps here. By 1995, when she wrote this and it was produced and directed it first at the McCarter, she had become head of the McCarter Theater Center in Princeton. Uh, in the years after execution of justice, she and Jerry Bamman, whom she had married, uh, were divorced. They they had a baby, and so she was a single mom, and she felt that she needed a more stable role of stable environment in order to be able to do what she wanted to do, which was direct and write plays and and also raise her son. Uh, in a in a stable in, environment, right? So she had applied for the position of uh, artistic director at the McCarter, and uh, they hired her. She was the first woman to be hired uh, to to run that theater, and uh, she fell in love with the, the book, and interestingly. So did Camille Cosby and uh, Judy Jameson. And uh, they gave enhancement money to uh, the McCarter to produce it and were also, you know, planning to take it to Broadway. They had envisioned a cast of, you know, 10 or more, but the, the history, oral history, if you will, uh, that the two sisters uh, wrote with Amy Hill Hearth is about two sisters, and Emily wanted to keep it that way. She thought it would be a tour de force for two two actors, and I, I think she was absolutely right. I mean, and and this is definitely a a, a feminist play. I mean, these and the, these women are rebels. You know, they're independent. Um, they have jobs that hardly anybody before them ever had who happened to be black Americans. Um, they don't particularly care for white Americans and they are somewhat sly about that, but it's there. And, uh, you know, and they both decided to be independent and never get married. And she and, tells a story, she tells a story though to the audience as if they're at the house of the two women, and it's kind of a, par a dinner party. It's kind of like a... Uh... It's a birthday party uh, okay. or sort of a celebration for uh, the women's late father. 
and the audience is kind of like invited in, I guess. And, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there were some other, and, and as I understand it from your book, that came from her visiting them and and interviewing them personally. And that's when she came up with that the idea to make it this party where they where she where people could experience what she experienced as an interviewer. And what she had also yes, in other words, uh, the audience is invited to partake of this this birthday celebration, if you will, and you know, which also involves cooking and making food and uh, they reminded Emily uh, to a great extent of experiences she had had when she was a child, you know, sitting in her grandmother's kitchen and watching her put together supper and that some of the greatest conversations uh, that she'd ever experienced happened when you were sitting in a kitchen, you know, as a kid and uh, and talking with your, your grandmother or your parents. Yeah. Um, so we... Um, Tavy is reminding me in the chat that we there are questions coming in, so I want to just speed up a little bit. But um, talk about some of the challenges, personal challenges she had at this time. And the one very significant personal challenge uh, was that uh, she had been about a year or so before she directed this. She had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And uh, frequently uh, at the end of a rehearsal at the McCarter and even on Broadway, uh, the play was staged at the Booth Theater. Uh, she had to be carried out uh, of the theater. Uh, and, uh, you know, carried out. What do you mean off. carried out? What do you mean carried out? Carried out. I mean, some two, uh, two people or one person had to actually, she couldn't walk. Wow. And so she had somebody had to lift her up and, and carry her to her car, drive her home, and then carry her from her, her car, you know, into her house at, at night wow. after, after rehearsal. Was that um, severe? So, you know, uh, on the one hand, she she loved directing this this play, uh, although there was considerable rivalry between the two actors who were playing uh, Bessie and Sadie. But uh, but it was also you know a, a painful experience. And I, one of the if one of the better things that came out of it was that after the Broadway production opened, uh, she was reviewed very positively. Uh, as a very good contrast to what had happened with execution. Um, she gave an interview uh, to Mel Gusso and went very public with the fact that she was suffering from multiple sclerosis. Okay, I was going to say that was not well known. Yeah. So just briefly, even though it's like my favorite, like, uh, chapter, uh, uh, Gloria, a life. Why is it your favorite? Because like the roller coaster that was, or the, that was happening to get this play together, I thought it was amazing, but started with, um, Kathy and Jimmy and some of the people approach Emily, uh, Gloria Steinem. That's the play is about Gloria Steinem and the movement for, for women's liberation. Um, and I think you have a line that says, man was walking on the Princeton campus where McCarter is one day uh, when Kathy and Jimmy called her, how would you like to write a play about Gloria? And man's telling it took her about two seconds to say yes. And it took about six years, I think, to get it mounted. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know if it took that long, but it, but it was not quick. Well, okay, to try to, to summarize as, as quickly as possible, it started out as to be a, a one-woman piece for Gloria Steinem to perform by herself uh, at Lincoln Center Theater. And uh, there was one reading for an invited audience, which miraculously I attended, uh, where Gloria actually did read the script, but uh, Gloria Steinem decided that she really couldn't, she was not up for that. She really couldn't do that. Uh, she was not somebody who could perform, uh, even if it was, you know, once every week. Uh, this, this was just not in her 
in her vocabulary, so to speak. And um, so ultimately a new director was hired, uh, Diane Paulus. And um, Paulus, during rehearsals, essentially took the script and uh, took the descriptions of uh, Gloria's memories and the imagery and uh, divided them up into scenes, you know, may, brought in other actors so that there was a large cast instead of just Gloria. And um, uh, Paulus really made it into an event. And Lincoln Center Theater was no longer involved. Uh, Daryl Roth was the sole producer and she produced it at her theater near Union Square in Manhattan. And it, it, it was an event. And uh, there, was, there was an act two, which was a talking circle, uh, which uh, is something that uh, always appealed to Lulu Steinem in her study and, and, and work with uh, Native Americans. And in this talking, the talking circle uh, at uh, Darrell, Darrell Ross Theater, you know, uh, mostly women attended, and uh, there was a lot of discussion about uh, what women should do to progress in, in the world. It coincided, the production coincided with uh, the hashtag MeToo movement, and uh, so there were a number of uh, every every night there were people in the audience who uh, described uh, harassment uh, or assault, uh, difficult situations that they had encountered. And just as one last point dealing with this play, uh, this was also uh, a, a writing this became a climactic moment in Emily's personal life because uh, at a TCG conference, I believe in 2018, uh, Theater Communications Group brought everybody into a room who wanted to talk uh, about whether or not they had been um, uh, sexually assaulted or harassed in, in some way during their careers. And Emily, broke down in sobs. She could. She really couldn't even walk out of the room because it brought to the fore an experience she'd had when she was a teenager and had gone to Europe for a trip during one summer before college and had been raped. And so it, it, it's it, in the book, it's, it's, it's a climactic moment in, in Emily's life, and it's also a climactic moment in her writing life. Right. And it became, from a playwright's perspective, where it started and where it ended were two completely different places. Not completely different, but different places. Oh, but, oh I think they, they are really completely different, yes. <laughs> well, they both have Gloria Steinem in the But uh, there are some questions. So Tavis, Tavis, telling me I have to move on. Um, and let's see, one of the questions is, uh, well, somebody commented that they saw, um, they took a class with Emily Mann that, and that she exhibited no signs of MS. So that was, that was good. Um, oh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, in, it, it's definitely in remission. That's definitely, yes. Okay. And somebody asked, uh, what is happening? What is she doing now? She you know, is working uh, other than promoting your book. <laughs> <laughs> She's been very, very generous uh, on that score. Yes. Uh, she has been an, a, um, a producer asked her to quote unquote adapt uh, <laughs> that word again. Uh, the pianist, uh, the memoir, the pianist okay. uh, for the stage. And so inspired by that, she has written uh, a play uh, based on uh, his, his experience. 
um, I can never pronounce his name, I'm sorry. And uh, she's actually directing a workshop of that. She'll be directing a workshop of that in June. And the, okay. the aim is to take it to Broadway. And she's working on a musical as well. Okay. Now, um, are there, I have some other questions that have to do about, you know, why, uh, and I, I don't know if I'm missing anything, Davy. You know, why you think um, she has been successful, or there, whether it's a personality thing or, you know, why, you know, what has made her be able to thrive in this entirely difficult environment that's mostly male dominated or was for most of her career? <clears throat> but if there's something else, you know, that I've skipped that you want to say, just pop that in now. Um, I think. I, it's a part of her personality. She she's never accepted the status quo. Uh, she uh, has always moved forward. If somebody says no to her, she will ask again and again. Uh, you know, until they either say yes or she she moves on. You know, in a in another direction. Uh, in, in a new environment. Uh, determination. And uh, although she might not describe it as self-confidence, I believe that there's, there's definitely an, an internal value of self and of her self's artistry that helps her uh, to keep going forward. I mean, it, it is an, an incredibly difficult um, arena for women. And even though it is, you know, it's improving, it, it improves slowly. So I have some other questions here. Uh, a couple relate to identity, um, the identity politics and theater now. You know, for example, having our say, uh, she's a white woman, she's writing about two black women. I think, I think the book author was white as well. But, um, you know, was this an issue? And, you know, how has she evolved on this? Or, you know, I mean, not evolved, but, you know, has her thinking changed as some people have? I mean, is it seen as cultural appropriation? Is it, that's one question. How does she feel about all the how does she feel about all the cultural appropriation rules? I don't know if they're rules, but you know, uh, questions are happening now. Well, it's an interesting question, and I haven't discussed with her how she feels at the moment in this evolving cultural environment. Uh, you know, she did direct an all black or multicultural um, production of, of A Streetcar Named Desire. Uh, there were thoughts of a new production on Broadway of Having Our Say, but she was not planning to direct that. Hmm. So I think that's a bit of a nod in the direction that you're implying. Okay. And um, there is a question about what was the solo reading by Gloria Steinem like? Oh, wow. Um, what a great question. It was, it, it was, it was sort of awe-inspiring and uh, yet one could, because she was standing at a uh, at a podium, and then occasionally she would sit down left, and she read most of the time. She she didn't look out at the audience very much, so there was a sense that she was not completely comfortable. Uh -huh. uh, She's know, kind of. Kind of shy as a person, actually. She's kind of shy. 
She's kind of shy, Gloria Steinem, as a person. Um, well, that's what I've been told. And, <laughs> you know, I don't know the woman. <laughs> um, let's see. We have another question. And we have about maximum, I'd say, five minutes before TV uh, cuts us off. But what do you think the future, do you think there's a future for documentary theater? Or is this type of style, uh, playwriting falling out of style? That's also uh, a very intriguing question. I think there definitely is a future for documentary theater. I, I don't know if we're ever gonna go back to the totally rigorous fact-based theater that some of the German playwrights espoused in the 1950s and early 60s. But I think we are more and more interested in the words and the voices of the people uh, around us and what they think, what, what they are, experiencing and uh, you know the political and social context in which they live their lives and in that respect I, I think documentary theater is going to continue to be powerful. So let's like make this maybe the wind up question but uh, you know other comparing to other women in theater some of them who, uh, well, this, I'll just read what you said. Some, play, some women playwrights uh, like Wendy Wasserstein had a lot of connections. Um, and Emily Mann uh, is, came in <laughs> with a passion for theater. Um, you know, so how do you think that she was able to, to do that? Where well, she 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 was talented. She was articulate. She didn't take guff from anybody. She could also be very charming. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, perhaps a, you know a combination of of all of those on a on a on a personal level. Uh, I. I submit again, re repeating myself, that she was always moving forward. She did not, I mean, the book was called Rebel Artist because she just, she just never took no for an answer. Really? You know, yeah, she, you know, she, which is not to say she didn't despair at times or she wouldn't be upset, but uh, if very quickly, I, one of my favorite stories is her encounter uh, in Princeton with um, what was then uh, a men's club in Princeton after she became artistic director, she was asked to speak to a group of the club's members. And uh, so she knocked on the door of this club in Princeton and a gentleman opened the door and he said, I'm sorry, but you can't come in the front door. Um, uh, only uh, the wisest members could come in the front door. You're gonna have to go in the back. And uh, she said, I don't go in the back door. Uh, and uh, he said, well, you'll have to. And she said, well, I'm supposed to talk. And if I don't go in the front door, uh, I'm not gonna give my speech. And he said, okay. And she went in the front door and gave her speech. That's a great story and a great metaphor. So I, we probably need to wrap up. And, um, you know, I encourage everybody to buy the book. It's like it was it was uh, an enjoyable uh, read and it also gave a lot of opportunity to think about and evaluate uh, theater and our role as playwrights. And um, thank you, you know, so much for joining us. And well, thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, uh, quite a challenge writing a biography, so I appreciate what you did and went through uh, to to get this uh, 
this 300 and 400 pages uh, together. And thank you for, you know, really paying attention to women in theater, you know, in, well, a, in a special way. Uh, same, same to you, Cindy. You're remarkable in that respect. International TV. Take it away. <laughs> I was going to say thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate your support and your continued support of ICWP and what we do here. And I'm so grateful to Cindy and to Alexis for joining us and speaking about this topic. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, come check us out. Come check out the book. And thanks again, you guys. All right. Good night. Bye. Bye.